Sundays are a great day to learn about God, but Sundays aren't the only day that God should move in your life. God should move through you each and every day of your life, no matter where you're at, no matter it's in the home, at school, at work, or anywhere else, including Sundays. Amen? Sunday is the day we come together to get fed, but when we leave here, we should pour out what we've learned or what God is speaking to us about onto everyone else. See, the fact is, if, I'm, I, if I have news I'm excited about, I can't help but share it with people, amen? So the thing is, we just need to be more excited about God so we share more about him, amen? It, if you have somebody who's a grandparent and they have a new baby, not the grandparent, they have a new grandchild. So if they have a new grandchild... They get a picture of them. You're going to see that picture probably about 500 times. Look, this is her laying down. I've seen a baby lay down before. Oh, yeah, you've seen a baby lay down, but not like this. This is him spitting up. TMI, but that's a nice picture. We get so excited about sharing things that come into our life and those things that excite us. We're not afraid or shy about sharing it with anybody. The gospel should be the same way, amen. We should be so excited about what God is doing in our life, even those times when it doesn't seem exciting to people outside of us. Because if you truly look at your life, everything, every day that you're alive, every day that you get to do something is another testimony for God. Amen? I'm going to pray and we're going to get started. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, the mighty name of Jesus, the name above all names. Father, we thank you, Father. <clears throat> and we praise your name, Father. We praise you for everything that you do and everything that you are, Father. The, the days that you make, Father. The sunshine and even the rain, Father. Because without the rain, the plants wouldn't get watered. Father, we thank you for everything that happens in our life, Father. We thank you for changing us from the inside out, Father. So we can be more like you each and every day, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today's message is entitled, Go Beyond Sundays. Go Beyond Sundays. So the phrase, go beyond, we talked about this last week, but it should sound familiar to those who have been here for any amount of time. Number one, we did a series on it in January called Go Beyond. And we talked about going past the walls. But also, if you walk around the place, you'll see little stickers on the floor that say go beyond. Those were put there as a reminder for us to go outside of our boundaries, to go past where we believe we can go. Amen? When, prior to last week, the Lord laid it on my heart to sort of rally the troops because no matter how good we are, no matter how great we love God, we all have issues getting down sometimes. We get excited when we first start, when we first get saved, we get so excited, we're in love with God. But then what happens is sometimes we trail off. We get excited when something new happens in our walk with Christ, but then we trail off again. So what happens is, just like a fire, you need to stoke that fire, amen? And sometimes we don't realize it, but when that fire is burning for a long time and it appears to go out, those logs aren't necessarily out. They're just cold on the outside, and they're still hot on the inside. So what we have to do is scrape off some of the junk that's been trying to attach to us 
so we can move forward and burn brighter and hotter and shine the light of Jesus wherever we go. Amen? But before going forward, we have to refresh on some things. A Christian is one who is a disciple of Christ. You agree with me on that? Five of you do, but the rest of you maybe not. A Christian is one who is the disciple of Christ. It's someone who is actively pursuing Jesus and his word. And they do that because of a relationship that they have with Christ. Not just believing in or having faith, but it's truly a relationship with Christ. See, I can believe in this chair, but I don't have a relationship with it. Right? I know it's there. Hopefully it's going to hold me when I sit down. But I don't have a relationship with it. And see, we can believe in Jesus. The Bible says that even the enemy believes in Jesus. Even the demons believe in Je Jesus and shudder because they respect him and fear him. They respect him and they know what he can do to them and what he's going to do to them. So they fear the outcome of what's going to happen because of their rejection of him. But God cannot grow you without expanding first. See, if you don't expand your mental capacity for who God is, he can't grow you in your walk with Christ. See, I can't just sit there and not pray and develop my relationship with God and not read the Bible and expect to be a better Christian tomorrow. That's a news flash for some people, right? Man, I thought I could just stay home, eat all day and play video games and watch movies and be a better Christian. Hmm, doesn't work like that. God cannot grow you without expanding you first. And even people that have been in the church for a long time, sometimes we have to change our mindset about who God is and what he can do through us in order for us to grow. We get so stuck in a mindset, well, this is the way it's always been and this is the way it's always going to be. Not unless you keep saying that. See, if we keep acting the same way we did when we got the results earlier, we're going to get the same results this time. <clears throat> In the same way, a church cannot grow unless we have more people inside of it. We cannot grow unless we expand the borders of our mind. Amen? See, if this church fills to capacity, the only way to have more people in it is have two services or grow the building, right? Well, it's the same way with us. See, we can't expand our knowledge of God without our expanding what we do to receive that knowledge. Amen? <clears throat> we have to decide that we don't care what people have said about us in the past. Your past and what people have said about you is one of the biggest things that holds you back. People may say, may have said in the past, you're ne never going to amount to anything. You're never going to be anything. You're never going to do anything. And sometimes that sticks with people for years and years. They may have said, you know what? You did too many bad things in your past. You can never do this. You can never do that. You're never going to mount anything because of the things you've done in the past. That's not true. God can redeem anybody. Sometimes people hold themselves back because what they did in their past to other people. Well, I've hurt too many other people. I can't, I can't move on from that. I've hurt too many people. I can't get into a good relationship because I've destroyed too many lives. doesn't work like that. God's a redeemer. He can change everything about you. You're not your past. You're not what people have said about you. You're, you are who you are today. Amen. So we have to go beyond our thoughts 
and go beyond ourselves. Amen. So st Acts 1, 8. Amen. We're going to begin to grow closer to God. And it's going to go like this. Amen. So in Acts 1, Jesus was taken up to heaven. But before he was taken up to heaven, he told them to wait on the Holy Spirit. I'm actually going to go back to verse 4. Sorry. It says, And being assembled together with them, the disciples, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to heaven, to Israel? Sorry. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times and the seasons for which the Father has put in his own authority. Um, <clears throat> the Lord had me go back, and it was after I set everything up in the computer, but the reason why is because so many times we worry about, hey, is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? And we lose track of the main focus. See, the disciples were asking Jesus about when he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Jesus said, you know what? That doesn't matter right now. I have something way more important to tell you. See, sometimes we want to ask God, God, when are you going to get me out of bondage? God says, if you do what I'm telling you to do, you'll get out of bondage. Amen? See, we keep asking God for things, and he keeps telling us, do what I told you to do, and it'll take care of itself. Amen? We worry about asking God for answers to questions that he's leading us to the answer for. Well, God, when you answer this, I'll do this for you. It doesn't work like that. You follow God, and God will take you where you need to go. Amen? So his disciples were so worried about getting an answer to something, they didn't realize they were the solution to the answer that he was at, they were asking for. When are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Well, if they did their job, it would have happened. Amen? So right after that, he tells them this. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. See, he was telling them, look, go out. And while you're going out, you will be restoring the kingdom to Israel as you go. We're the answer to the question that we're asking God for. God, why don't you fix my life? Start spending more time with him and it'll fix itself. So he's talking to them about that and then in Acts 2, the disciples go into the upper room and wait for the Holy Spirit. Which you don't have to do anymore. It's freely given. Amen. And we're going to get into more detail on that in just a minute. But after the Holy Spirit comes down and inhabits the believers, they start speaking in tongues. Okay? So they're speaking in tongues and... Um, Well, one thing real fast on that. <clears throat> so tongues is not a requirement. Every believer can do it, um, depending on the type of tongues you're talking about. There's a message in tongues, which is given for the body or to individuals, and that's given by the Holy Spirit at times. 
Um, but then there's a prayer language in tongues, and that's given to everybody. Everybody could do it. It's just a matter of uh, getting past ourselves and doing it. It's like walking by faith. People know how to do it. People just don't want to. Uh, people want to make decisions based off the facts, based off the weather, based on all these things. But God says make decisions on what he tells you to do. And what he tells you to do something, do it. That's walking by faith. Amen? <clears throat> so, but tongues is something you should desire to have because it's a language of prayer that you can pray to your Heavenly Father. Amen? But God used this tongues, and it says as they were speaking in tongues, it says other people were listening. And they were speaking in languages that they did not know that other people had come from all over the, the world to come back to, to Jerusalem for the feast, and they were hearing them in their language. Everybody passes that by, but that's a miracle. You get a hundred different people speaking a hundred different languages, and they all heard the gospel in their language. That's amazing. I've met several people that this has happened to where they went overseas and they were talking to someone and the translator said, they said, hey, could you translate that for me? And they said, that doesn't need a translation. You just spoke it in Russian. And they thought they spoke it in English. See, God can take care of all that. God's way bigger than we ever allow him to be. Amen? Amen. And that's part of us getting out of our shell, understanding that God is way bigger than we perceive him to be. And he can do way more than we give him credit for. Amen? So, all these believers start speaking in tongues, which sounds like basically someone speaking a foreign language. So when they do, the locals at first start making fun of them. And then they repent because at first they're like, hey, these dudes are drunk. Because they're hearing a language that they don't know. They're thinking they're drunk. So then when they start hearing them, then they start hearing the gospel. Through their own language. So if I heard somebody speaking Chinese, I might think they're drunk too. Unless the, until a Chinese man starts giving his life to the Lord because he heard it in their language, right? So then after they start making fun of him, Peter speaks up and explains what's going on. He says, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about, that in the last days the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon all believers. Amen? And we're apparently still in those last days. So if Peter said it's the last days, 2,000 years later, I'm pretty sure it's the last days. And it says in... Acts 2, verse 37, it says this. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and, set, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Bless you. <clears throat> then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, first of all, baptism. Regular baptism it's not a requirement to be saved. The thief on the cross wasn't baptized. But that's because he didn't get a chance to get baptized. So it's not a requirement to get to heaven, but it is a requirement to be a disciple. Amen? Baptism is an outward expression of your inward feeling about Christ. Amen? And it's a mirror of what Jesus did going into the tomb and being buried and then rising again. 
So it's the old man being buried underneath the water. Baptism requires a full immersion in the water. Jesus wasn't halfway buried up to his waist. Amen. He was buried all the way in the tomb. So baptism is an immersion fully in water. And then you come up. So you're burying the old man or woman. You're raising up new in Christ. Amen. <clears throat> so dis disciples are followers of Christ. And Jesus got baptized himself because he told John, this has to be done to fulfill Scripture. So if you want to be like Christ, you have to be baptized. Amen? So if you want to be a disciple, you want to be like Christ, you have to get baptized. And baptism is also the first act of obedience after salvation to become a disciple and becoming a disciple. Amen? <clears throat> and on a side note, you have to be baptized to be a member of the church. Or, sorry, not a member, a partner of the church. Almost <clears throat> I'm going to get used to that. So, verse 38, it's, again it says, repent and be baptized. That word repent means to change one's mind, to turn away from one's past. Amen? To turn away from one's past, turn away from one's past sins, to turn away from the lifestyle that you were living to turn to Christ. Amen? It, Jesus said something in a story about there was a woman who came and he went to Simon the Pharisee's house and there was a woman who came and she came in and she poured oil on him, wiped his, his feet with her hair, and Jesus tells Simon the Pharisee, Simon the Pharisee starts saying, hey, he starts thinking in his mind, hey, if this guy was really a prophet, he wouldn't allow this woman to touch him if he knew she, who she was. So, <coughs> excuse me. So Jesus, hearing that, hearing his thoughts, tells him a story. And he says, the point of the story was, the one who is loved much will be forgiven much. I mean, the one who has been forgiven much will love much. The one who has been forgiven little will love little. And that's like Christianity. Sometimes when we don't feel like we've been forgiven from a lot, it seems like our love for Jesus isn't as much as it should be. See, when you take someone who's a complete sinner who's far away from Christ, and then they give their life to the Lord, they're willing to give up everything because there was nothing to hold on to. Amen? Their life was trash. I mean, who wants to keep that, right? But if you have someone that maybe didn't feel like they were much of a sinner, but then they gave their life to, the, to Christ, and there was nothing really to give up, to be a disciple, except their heart, sometimes you don't see the love for Christ that you see in other people who have radical conversions. But that word repent means to turn away from it. doesn't matter how many sins you have. doesn't matter if your sins are great or small. We're all great sinners before we get saved. The problem is some people don't see themselves as a big sinner or as big of a sinner as some people. Some people are like, well, I wasn't, I wasn't a drug addict, so I'm not that bad. Well, we all have issues. We all have great sins. It's just a matter of if they're on the outside or the inside. Some people hold them in and hide them really good. Amen? Amen? Some people's sins are more outward, amen, like mine were. But either way, we have to repent and turn away from. <clears throat> Notice he says, he says, be cleansed by baptism. So baptism is also a mental cleansing. 
going into the water and being baptized is also a mental cleansing. But it says, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Gift means freely given. So a gift, if I give you a gift, all you have to do is receive it. Amen? You don't have to work for it. It's a gift. Amen? So if I give somebody a $100 gift card to Walmart, what happened if they just put it in their wallet or their purse and they never used it? They'd be an idiot, but anyway. Maybe they're like, hey, I don't believe, Pastor. Put anything on this card. Right? If he really knew me, he wouldn't have gave me this gift card. Right? That's what we do with God. Well, if God really knew me, he wouldn't, he wouldn't allow me to do this. Well, God gave me that, but I, I'm just, I don't think he, he really gave that to me, so I'm just going to not use it. A gift is given. There's no strings attached. You don't have to work for it. God gives you a gift. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to work for it. You know what? God gave me a gift. I'm going to work for it. I'm going to make myself cleaner and better and a better Christian so I can use the gift that he gave to me freely. It don't work like that. A gift is given, and all you have to do is receive it. Amen? So why do we not have to wait? Why did they have to wait if we don't? There's a very simple explanation. They were the first ones to receive it. Jesus went to heaven, and although the Holy Spirit was here because it says in the beginning of creation, the Spirit was hovering over the water, so you know he was there before. The Spirit of God is everywhere, omnipresent. But when Jesus went up, he said, when I go to the Father, I'm going to send another helper. Jesus was the first helper. He said, I'm going to send another helper. And then when he told him to go wait in Jerusalem, he said, wait for the promise that I've been telling you about. He'd been telling them about it the whole time, and all they had to do was wait for it. But they were the first ones to receive it because it was the first time it came down. So after that, you don't have to wait. Because when you get baptized, you give your life to the Lord. Well, as soon as you give your life to the Lord, the Holy Spirit's inside of you. And then you have everything, all access to anything the Holy Spirit has. Amen? So let's pick it back up in verse 38. It says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord will receive. The promise of salvation and the Holy Spirit is not just for you. It's to everyone, including those who seem far off. Amen? We write people off sometimes. Well, they're never going to get saved. They're always going to be like that. They're always, they're a bum. They're always going to be a bum. They probably thought that about you too. Well, they're good, but they're not, never going to be great. They're never going to accept God because they just think they know everything. Right? Oh, they're too far gone. They need, they need God's help. That's the only way they're going to change. The truth is, God wants everybody to receive him. It says that God's will is that none shall perish, but all shall receive eternal life. But the truth is, we have a choice in the matter. It says the Holy Spirit is the revealer of truth. The revealer of truth, we just have to open our eyes to see it. But the Bible says that if we get too close to the God of this world, it says he blinds the eyes of those who want to receive Christ. Amen? But you're never too far gone. Even Legion, who was up in the, the, the mountains, 
when he heard Christ was down, he had over a thousand demons inside him, yet he was more powerful than those demons. He went to Christ. Those demons could not stop him going to Christ. Amen? So that promise is for you and for everyone who is far off. So what happens is we have a gift, we have a promise, we have everything in us. But you know what we do sometimes? We try to hold it to ourselves. We're sitting there and we hold everything to ourselves. We say, you know what? I'm not going to give this to anybody. Nobody can have this. Nobody can. Nobody. If it was a baby picture, you'd be one to show everybody. If you just won the lottery, well, you probably wouldn't want to tell people about it. I'll tell you a quick story. It's true. <clears throat> so, my dad, he said this. He said, if I ever win the lottery, I'm not going to tell anybody. He said, I'm going to wait till the last possible day to collect the money. He said, I'm going to move somewhere that nobody knows me and get a new phone number <laughs> so no one can call me asking me for money because if they didn't want to talk to me before why do they want to talk to me when I got money that's wisdom right there <laughs> just go to the same church if you win <laughs> but if I have something that's that amazing. Something that can change people's lives. Why would I want to hold on to it and not share it? That's just selfish. The only reason I wouldn't share such an awesome gift. Think about this. Someone sneezes, we give them a tissue. Hey. Right? You're welcome. Because he needed that, right? But people need Christ more than that. It's either that we're ashamed to tell people that we're Christian or we don't think the gift is that great. Sometimes we care more about what we look like than helping someone. Someone's dying of thirst and you got a 24 pack of water in your car. You're like, you know what? I would love to help them, but I'm afraid to go give them a bottle. That's ridiculous. We'll give out tissues. But will we give out Christ? See, Jesus told them to go out beyond where they were to leave this place and go tell people about the gospel. He said, when you go, he said, wait for the gift that I'm going to give you. Wait till you have the Holy Spirit inside of you because the Holy Spirit, he said before, would remind you of all things. Everything he was teaching them, everything you've read in the Bible, the Holy Spirit will remind you of. That person needs comfort, you're their comforter. Amen? That person needs redemption, you lead them to Christ. Whatever it is that they need, you're their provider. The Bible says to give to any man who asks. Someone can be starving for food and we'll hand out food but we won't give them what they really need. And that's Jesus. The Bible says it's better that the body shall perish to save the soul. We care more about saving the body 
than the most important part. When your life changes, when your life truly changes, you start changing other lives by default. See, when you start getting closer to Christ, the Bible says out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You start speaking more about Christ. You start telling others about Christ. Instead of that picture, you're like, hey, let me show you this Bible verse. I heard you talking about something. There's a scripture that will change your life. You're hurting. There's a scripture that says he cares for the hurting. It says that his burdens are light. His yoke is easy. Everything that we need to help people is in here. It's all in here. And the closer we get to it, the more it comes out. Amen? You get around somebody long enough, you'll find out what they're passionate about. Grandkids are first, probably. In the New Testament, in the book of Acts, they heard and then they went. They heard, then they went. They weren't confined to just being inside. They weren't confined to a church. They did house to house ministry, but they didn't say, you know what? When we start having more than 12 people, we're just going to build a bigger house. Stop inviting people because it's getting too crowded. We have food and I don't even get seconds anymore. So stop inviting people. They didn't do that. They just expanded and expanded and expanded because of what was in their heart. See, if church stays just a Sunday thing for you and isn't a Sunday afternoon thing, isn't a Sunday evening thing, isn't a Monday thing, a Tuesday thing, a Friday thing, a Saturday thing, you're never going to be passionate about it. See, if you only talk to people about church and Jesus when you're in church, that's an issue. If you're married and you go out, they're like, hey, what are you doing? Nothing. Are you married? Yeah. How come we never heard about your wife? I didn't even know you were married. I've known you 30 years. Do you have kids? Yeah. Four. What? Never heard you talk about them. Now I guarantee you that almost every person you work with, especially if you work with somebody for a long amount of time, they probably know if you're married or not. They know how many kids you have. But do they know if you serve Jesus? Do they know if you have a relationship with Jesus? If we're willing to talk about everything else, why aren't we willing to talk about Jesus? So I'm going to ask you today to go beyond where you're at. To go beyond just having a Sunday relationship with Jesus. And make him something that's 24-7. Don't go that... Don't be like this, okay? <laughs> Don't be like, when it's Sunday morning, like, hey, where's my Bible? We have to leave. I don't know. 
You go around the house. Where's the Bible? Where's the Bible? Where's the Bible? When's the last time I used it? Church on Sunday. Oh, it might still be in the car. Okay. And you might say, you know what? Pastor, I feel guilty. It was in the car because I used my phone to read the Bible. Or when you pull it off the shelf and you have to go like, oh, hold on. In my Bibles, hold on, I got to bend some pages so the pastor thinks I read it. <clears throat> no. We have to go beyond just being a Sunday Christian. And we have to become a true disciple of Christ. Amen. That starts with number one, have a, re a relationship with him. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says that if we believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and we claim him, say that he is Lord, we will be saved. If we say that Jesus is our Lord, but saying Jesus is Lord is not as easy as it sounds. Saying Jesus is Lord is saying I see him as my Lord more than that television. Jesus being your Lord does not make you a servant. It makes you a son of God. Which means that you have to develop a relationship with him. You have to say, you know what? I don't care about all these other things anymore. He's going to be first in my life. Not that you don't do other things. You don't have to read the Bible 24-7. But you do have to read it. Amen? If you're married and you don't talk to your spouse for four years, there's probably going to be some issues. Or if you only talk to your spouse on Sundays, you might not be married anymore. So a relationship with Christ is back and forth, talking and listening. And it's not a one day a week thing. It's an every day a week thing, amen? Even when you're on vacation, uh-oh. You know, you can go to church on vacation. You can go somewhere else. I don't want you to, but it's, it's allowed on vacation. But then once you become a disciple of Christ, once you put your trust in him and make him Lord of your life, it's about expanding who, who you think you are into who he says you are. Amen? It's about changing your life and adapting your life to his. No matter how bad it hurts, no matter how bad the changes hurt, you don't change for yourself, you change for the other people. Amen. When I became a Christian, there was a time when I was just like, whatever, I'm just going to stop everything because I didn't realize. And honestly, I didn't realize nobody told me to. I just stopped doing things. It just, stuff just started falling off me. But then after a while, there was other things that I had to give up that I didn't give up for me. I gave up for other people. Because I didn't want to mess up anybody's walk with my walk. I didn't want to go to work and somebody say, well, why are you doing this? I thought you were a Christian. That's your biggest critic. So I would give things up. God never told me anything. But the Bible says man in himself cannot do good. So anything that you do is actually God speaking to you about changing. Amen? But we have to live our life so that we let our light shine. Amen? So that we adapt our lives to God's. We don't have to wait 
if God has to tell you to do something, that's like a parent telling a child what to do. It's the last possible scenario. Amen? We should see how we're supposed to live in this word and then adapt our life to it. Amen?